I'd like to begin tonight with the following land acknowledgement. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of the land and the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Good evening. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Yvette Moy, and I am the University of Washington's Director of Public Lectures, and our offices are housed within the Graduate School. Um, so thank you for joining us tonight. Um, before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to run through with you really quickly. Um, first of all, if you haven't done so already, please take out your cellular devices and turn them to silent. Um, that happened last week. I asked for that and somebody's phone rang. It was very funny. Um, and we ask you to please refrain from video or audio recording this evening's lecture. Um, it will, we are recording it and we'll have it available on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you haven't subscribed, please do so. Um, Office of Public Lectures. Um, and it'll be up there within 24 to 48 hours following this lecture. Um, we ask that you please refrain from taking photographs of our speaker um, while they're um, at the podium. It's very distracting for them. And this evening, we have a couple ways for you to ask questions of our speaker. Um, there are two aisle microphones, as well as a way for you to email them in. And the email address is mayiask at uw.edu. Um, this evening, I want to welcome our new student assistant named Meenal. You might have encountered her out in the lobby. This is her very first official day in the role, so we're very happy to have her with us. I know, it's hard to find staff, so we're, we're celebrating. Um, and then tonight, uh, Dr. Grumbach um, will be introduced by the University of Washington's professor and chair of political science, as well as the director of the Center for American Politics and Public Policy, Dr. John Wilkerson. Thanks, Yvette. As Yvette said, I'm John Wilkerson, and tonight it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Jake Grumbach. Uh, Jacob Jake M. Grumbach is an associate professor of political science at the University of Washington and a faculty associate with the Harry Bridges uh, Center for Labor Studies. Dr. Grumbach's research focuses on, on the political economy of U.S. democracy with an emphasis on public policy, racial and economic inequality, American federalism, and statistical methods. His very successful book, Laboratories of Democracy, was published in July of 2022, and it was recently recognized as one of the best books of 2022 by The New Yorker. So buy a copy. Jake's research has appeared or is forthcoming in the American Political Science Review, uh, the American Journal of Political Science, American Journal of Public Health, Business and Politics, Election Law Journal, Journal of Politics, Legislative Studies Quarterly, Perspective on Politics and Political Research Quarterly, and much, much more. Um, very accomplished scholar at this early stage in his career. And previously, uh, Dr. Grumbach was a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for the Study of Democratic Politics at Princeton University. He received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in 2018. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jake Grumbach. Well, thanks. All right, that's on too, loud and clear. Um, well, thanks so much, John, for that uh, great introduction. That's a big deal. That's my boss, the chair of the department, so <laughs> that's very nice of him. Um, thanks uh, to Yvette Moy and her amazing team for putting on this series of events. Uh, there are many more illustrious speakers than, than I uh, coming up this year, so definitely uh, don't miss those. Um, and thanks to you all for coming uh, on this even pretty chilly uh, autumn evening and thanks especially, uh, I see my family in the audience, very uh, sweet of them to join. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's talk about uh, the state of American democracy in the 2022 midterms. Uh, so in this talk, uh, you might want to see a little bit of forecasting here of what's going to happen in uh, uh, the upcoming midterms. <laughs> 
And uh, with forecasting, you know, this is sort of the, you know, pop part of, of sort of poli-sci adjacent research is to quanti quantitatively forecast our best bets of who's going to take the House or Senate in a midterm year or who's going to take a state legislature. Uh, and in uh, every four years, who's going to win a presidential election. This is the 538 uh, uh, forecast, and this aggregates, so polls and tries to correct for polling non-response. Now only a few percent of us answer the phone for pollsters anymore, so it's really important to correct uh, that our estimates based on people not responding on the phone. And then they also add in statistically the fundamentals often uh, are things like economic growth, unemployment, sometimes the approval of the sitting president. As, as you probably know, structurally in midterm election years, the president's party tends to lose seats in Congress and in state legislatures, right? In a national wave against the president. And, but this is like the most pop, not, I would say least important part of political science research is forecasting elections. This is mostly hobbyism for fun, so we can sort of sweat and, uh, you know, freak ourselves out and root for our, you know, team, just like we're rooting for our team in the playoffs or, you know, in the NFL or NBA. Um, and you might get a, a text, like, if you're anything like myself, you might get a text from your mom, like, ooh, I was watching cable news and they're forecasting our, our side's going to do better because you saw the latest stupid things somebody from the other party said. But that's... a uh, that's, you know, the pop side of ho political hobbyism, which is really entertaining, but really to know what's going on in American politics and in a really precarious moment in American democracy, we have to look beyond the horse race. We have to look to, to actual policy and institutions, the rules of the game themselves, right? So uh, many of our political behaviors, they flow through institutional rules and norms in ways that we can tell kind of what's gonna happen structurally. And our sort of uh, political ambitions are really constrained by these institutions. So we have to understand what's going on through policy and institutional rules. And that's what uh, the rest of this talk is gonna be about because we really are in a precarious moment of American democracy where institutions are under threat, the rules of democracy themselves. Not just which team is gonna win, but actually do we have an equitable, free, and fair uh, ability to participate in democracy? Do we have uh, a sufficient rule of law when those who lose elections leave office? Um, and so forth. So uh, now I'm gonna, uh, in turning to this crisis of American democracy we're living in, the horse race style uh, perspective on American politics is gonna really focus all of our attention on what's going on in Washington, D.C., you know, and after 2016, especially what's going, what went on in the White House with respect to American democracy. But actually, the U.S. has a remarkably unique constitutional system that puts the rules of democracy, the rules of the game, not in Washington, D.C., but at the state level, in state legislatures and in state bureaucracies and delegated sometimes to uh, county level administrators. So that's where we're, we need to look at when we're going to look at trends and the health of American democracy. And that's what the rest of this talk is about. So a little summary of where I'm going. So American federalism in the Constitution, that's having two separate independent levels of government, the national government, Congress, the president, the Supreme Court, as well as state level government in the constitutions, governorships, state legislators, and state courts, right? American federalism is quite unique in giving a ton of authority to that lower level, the state level. Now, there are dozens of federal systems around the world, Germany, Canada, Mexico, India, many others that delegate authority to a lower level of government, like provincial governments, as well as having a national government. But the U.S. is quite unique in giving so much authority to the state level. And over the past generation, my research has really been investigating the trends in state level policy and what we've seen over the past generation that I'll take you through is states diverging in policies with some states becoming, uh, you know, increasing taxes on high earners, sort of strengthening labor protections, expanding the welfare state, increasing the minimum wage, 
uh, and so forth, and other states doing the opposite, cutting taxes, deregulating, for example, firearm ownership, uh, restricting access to abortion, and so forth. So we're seeing a divergence in policies across states. That's in part because of structural economic changes that have hit the world and the US over the past generation, but it's also because of state level policy changes that I'll talk about. But more importantly, the second half of this talk is not just about states diverging in gun control or reproductive rights or health insurance policy, right? But actually diverging on the quality of the democratic institutions themselves, the rules of the game. How fair are legislative districts drawn? How accessible is voting? And uh, do those who lose elections, do they uh, leave power when they uh, lose that election? Um, all of those have been diverging with major consequences for uh, sort of the uh, political economy of the US and everyone's lives. So here, this is a piece out of some of my uh, research, I had an edited volume called American Political Economy, and I co-wrote this with Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson. Uh, what I'm showing here is on the left is income growth since 1940 and the starting sort of wealth levels of a state. So what you see here in this left side of the plot is in the mid 20th century, the poorest states in the top left, like Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, in the mid 20th century, they actually grew the fastest in their economies, so which converged the economies of different states. Basically, the poorer states started catching up to the wealthier states, and the states overall started converging, right? And that's thanks to many national public policies that were passed that sort of increased economic baselines across states. For example, Social Security in the mid-1930s, prior to this, states had their own patchwork set of laws. Some states had old age insurance for some. Some states had no old age insurance. And actually, senior citizens died at rates of poverty upwards of 90% in these states, right? If you didn't come from uh, if you didn't have children that ended up wealthy, like you ended up destitute if you lived to uh, successfully live to old age. Those sort of mid-century policies really standardized economic policy across the states and made states a lot more similar. The South really caught up to the wealthier North during this time period. On the right side, however, I'm showing changes in state income since 1990. And what you see there in that flat line is that you can't tell anything about a state's economic growth from its starting economic position. Rather, wealthier states are growing and poorer states uh, may or may not be growing. And we're gonna see during this period since the 1990s, once again, a divergence in economic outcomes between states, unlike the mid 20th century, right? This has had a transformational effect on the economy of the United States where now uh, uh, rates of poverty, rates of, uh, uh, socioeconomic and health outcomes, even uh, prime age mortality, those sorts of outcomes are diverging across states. And more recently, we've tracked uh, sort of prime age mortality, that is sort of dying before you're expected to in the US, and we're seeing this exact divergence in mortality outcomes. Uh, uh, if you click on my website, you'll see a few public health papers that sort of uh, delve into this effect. But here, since the 2000s, thanks to, in part, uh, new crises like the opioid crisis, uh, easier and more accessible gun ownership, and then more recently, rates of vaccination and uh, sort of PPE use, but especially vaccination in the COVID era, have caused further divergence between states in mortality, with uh, hundreds of thousands of preventable deaths happening because of this divergence in state level policy. So something as little as Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, right? This gives free federal money to states to expand their Medicaid program for low income individuals health insurance, right? The refusal of about 17 states to expand Medicaid with this federal money, uh, we've tracked has caused about 45,000 annual preventable deaths. These are non-trivial rates of death diverging between states as opposed to the mid 20th century, which saw the opposite trend, states converging in their outcomes as poorer states were catching up thanks to national economic and social policies. And it's not just state policy changes that have caused this divergence though, it's also structural economic changes, 
where uh, you know, two generations ago in the mid 20th century, I say, I guess it's, I can't keep saying one generation is the 1970s, right? Now it's unfortunately that's basically two generations. I know time flies. The music 70s though, that was incredible. Um, <laughs> uh, here, divergence also in terms of uh, economic outcomes based in the decline of American manufacturing and the decline of organized labor in the US. So here, when you uh, had uh, states and cities that could have been exurban, rural, highly urban, all tended to have some manufacturing base that produced sort of middle class wages and middle class outcomes, that has now diverged where now economic activi activity is concentrated in high, sort of high performing cities like Seattle and other cities on the coast and has really declined in the Rust Belt and Sun Belt over this time period, right? So the combination of state level policy changes and these structural economic changes have made states more different now and your state of residence more tied to your socioeconomic outcomes than it has been since the early 20th century, okay? So the mid 20th century, think of this as standardizing outcomes across states. We're now in, once again, a period of divergence between states. But it's not just divergence on those sort of major socioeconomic and health policies and socioeconomic outcomes, right? That we'd sort of expect by regular politics. You know, conservative states are gonna, to some extent, pass conservative policies, more liberal states, more liberal policies. They're gonna start being different on, you know, climate change regulation. These coastal environmental states, like Washington State, are gonna have stricter environmental regulation than a state with a lot of, uh, you know, oil and coal production and where the population's not as environmentalist, like Louisiana or West Virginia or something like that, right? That's sort of to be expected. Maybe not this extent of the divergence we've seen, but what's really unexpected is divergence on democratic institutions themselves, the rules of American democracy, okay? So it's not just economic and social policy that's diverging, it's rules about who can participate in American politics and how. Rules like uh, with respect to election administration, who is eligible to vote, how difficult is it for them to vote, rules in legislative districting and the extent of gerrymandering, which you've probably heard of, Essentially, does one party empower its voters and disempower the other party's voters uh, through the uh, construction of gerrymandered legislative maps for US House seats and state legislative seats? And finally, are elections vulnerable to what's called electoral subversion? The idea that the non-rightful winner of the election ends up taking office in what's sort of like a, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, a subtle or uh, a subtle coup. So uh, we have to ask, so as I mentioned before, American federalism puts almost all authority over democratic institutions at the state level, not at the national level. Other uh, developed democracies often have uh, regulate elections and democracy also at the national level, right? The US has what's called the Federal Elections Commission, right, out of the White House. Right, that's a national agency. But does that regulate elections? No, does anybody know? This, this is a classroom I teach in too, so this is uh, especially familiar. Um, in winter quarter I'm teaching back in this classroom, but does anybody know what the Federal Elections Commission or FEC does regulate? Yeah, just money and politics, nice. Um, can't, I can't quite see what, it, uh, um, maybe one of my students. Um, <laughs> uh, so. The FEC regulates campaign finance, money in politics, but it doesn't actually regulate at all who's allowed to vote or not. That's all up to the state, right? But we have to ask, okay, just putting all this authority at the state level with respect to democracy, does that leave American democracy more robust and stronger? Or does it make American democracy more vulnerable to democratic backsliding and threats to democracy? So this is sort of a topic of my book that my chair John mentioned, Laboratories Against Democracy. It's about really the US uh, uh, constitutional structure of putting states in charge of democratic institutions while we have highly national political parties and national attention to politics. So, so our attention is highly national, but states are who regulate the rules of the game. So is that helpful or harmful? 
So there's a long line of theory going back all the way to really the 1780s and the founding of the US, which suggests that uh, putting all this authority at the state level is actually really advantageous for democracy. States are champions of democracy. One line of thinking there is that, uh, you know, this decentralization, having states being able to customize their own policies, that really brings voters much closer together with their representatives, right? So if you hear your local representative or your state legislative candidate campaigning at a speech, they're typically gonna say, listen, I'm your local King County representative, unlike the distant fat cats in DC, right? And there's some truth to that, right? They're, a lot, they're geographically more proximate to you. They might sort of, you know, care about similar issues as the hope. That would be one advantageous thing about having the states hold a lot of authority in American politics. A second is that if we can have different states customize policy on contentious issues, then we wouldn't be so mad at each other nationally and there wouldn't be so much polarization to the point where now individuals don't want their children to marry somebody who supports the opposing political party, right? High levels of polarization. And the theory here goes, if we can take a contentious issue like abortion rights that really divides the country or right now like transgender rights or something, if we can just customize it and you know, more liberal states can have more liberal laws about trans rights and more conservative states can restrict trans rights. You know, everybody's gonna be happy, goes the story there. In addition, if you don't like the laws that are in your state, you can leave your state. You can vote with your feet is a classic theory, right? So not only can you vote out the people you don't like in your state, if you really don't like the, what's going on in politics and policy in your state, just move states. And we've heard this with respect to recent abortion bans in states, right? Is the idea, oh, may, you know, I, people thinking, I'll send my child to college in a state that has the types of policies that we as a family may prefer. States also can learn from each other potentially, right? Serve as laboratories of democracy. Here the theory goes, states are gonna do policy experiments. Other states can copy those successful policy experiments, ones that grow the economy. Right? And they can reject the failed experiments. And wouldn't it be a shame, this theory goes, if we only had one laboratory of democracy in the national government. But we luckily have 50 laboratories of democracy. It also gives you insurance against, uh, wait, wait for the, the next set of slides. You may be, may be, may be presaging something. Um, so it also provides a little bit of insurance against national swings. If you're in a, you know, uh, I'll give you another projection, I believe, you know, uh, the state government of Washington state will remain uh, democratic, uh, democratically controlled. That gives some insurance against a Republican takeover of the national government, right? And same thing if you're in a solidly Republican state and the Democrats sweep Congress and the presidency, right? That gives you some insurance. Policy's not gonna swing because your state level policy's gonna stay uh, sort of similar as it is. Um, it gives you some insurance against big fluctuations in uh, what's going on, policies that uh, sort of affect your life. And finally, James Madison coined it in the Federalist Papers, the notion of double security. This theory we heard a lot about after 2016, which was thank God for federalism now because a would-be autocrat in Washington, D.C. can't capture 50 election administrations across the country, right? That was a theory of double security, that having states run elections means that a would-be tyrant who takes the presidency, which the founders were quite concerned about, laudably, right, like some real problems with the founders, but laudably they did care about like uh, autocracy in that narrow sense, and their, uh, part of their I, uh, sort of argument for federalism was that a would-be autocrat could not take over all the states very easily, there'll be some oppositional, for example, governors and state legislatures and so forth. And you saw this, right? When Trump won in 2016, you saw entrepreneurial Democratic governors, Inslee, Gavin Newsom, others, thinking I can really succeed politically by sort of putting myself in opposition to this out-party president. Whereas now you see, uh, for example, uh, Ron DeSantis in Florida doing the same thing with respect to the Biden administration and uh, Democratic Congress, right? So there's pop versions of these theories all over the place, right? So you're on the left side of the panel is David Brooks who writes federal power, meaning national powers, 
impersonal, uniform, abstract, and rule-oriented. Local power is personalistic, relational, affectionate, irregular, and based on a shared history of reciprocity and trust. On the right side of the panel is Yuval Levin's book from 2017, The Fractured Republic, which really argued that uh, if we could delegate more authority to states, right, we'd be less at our throats, at each other's throats nationally, and we could diffuse the tension out of uh, sort of the, the really sort of, you know, uh, high temperature conflictual issues nationally that are dividing the country, right? And he was really writing with respect at, uh, you know, issues of LGBT rights and reproductive rights and things like that uh, would be great to delegate to the state level and diffuse this national tension. So those were sort of like, I'd call, I guess, pop center right versions of these theories, but there's pop center left versions of these theories. So they, and uh, even more than pop, there's academic versions. Uh, the current uh, dean of Yale Law School, Heather Gerken, uh, offers this theory she calls progressive federalism. And she argues that federalism and decentralization has been really advantageous for new immigrant groups and uh, uh, black Americans and Asian Americans and Latino Americans for, with respect to their ability to hold elective office. That's called descriptive representation in political science, is when a particular uh, racial or gender or other sort of social group in society gets to see its members hold office. And Heather Gerken argues, in all these majority minority cities and states, we see a huge amount of, uh, of black, Latino, and Asian American representation in city councils and mayors and uh, state legislatures and so forth that we couldn't have if we just had a national level of uh, government and politics, right? Because these groups would not be numerous enough to get that sort of descriptive representation nationally. So those, I'm taking you through a set of theories for why decentralization and American federalism might be advantageous for democracy and the relationship between the, the governing and the governed, right? But there's a counter set of theories that I'm in part sort of resurrecting here for how decentralization actually leaves American politics and society more vulnerable to threats to democracy. So thanks for, uh, I think, uh, giving us a little heads up that there's gonna be some downsides to some of those. Uh, states as democratic champions theories. The first theory of decentralization and states being really disadvantageous and threatening to democracy is the kind of the obvious historical pattern that throughout, uh, throughout American history, it's when it comes to civil rights, whether that's the franchise for black Americans, Native Americans, later on the franchise for women, right? actually in the U.S. South, then later on again for black Americans through 1965, um, and in some cases in some states through the 1970s. But here the pattern has consistently been the Supreme Court enables state legislatures to restrict voting rights and civil rights. For example, after Reconstruction and the Civil War, the Supreme Court through Plessy v. Ferguson says state-level Jim Crow laws if states want to do that, we're not going to stop them. And then states decide to do that or not, and states do. States Then state legislatures pass restrictive anti-democracy laws like Jim Crow uh, disenfranchisement laws. And then Congress, at the national level, decides whether to step in, like they did with the Voting Rights Act, to, to say Jim Crow state laws are illegal and all states must provide voting rights to black Americans, or they decide not to. Right? So the trend has consistently been, and this is something the original American sort of social scientist, W.E.B. Du Bois, first pointed out in his book, Black Reconstruction in 1935, was the pattern was that civil rights activists consistently called on the national government to step in to stop states from restricting democracy. So that's something that sort of uh, states as democratic champions has to contend with. A second sort of theory of how states might be threatening to democracy is the reverse of that double security idea. While it's true that when a would-be autocrat takes power in Washington, you don't want to immediately hand them all the authority over all election administration in the country. That doesn't seem like a great idea. But by contrast, having decentralized election administration allows anti-democracy groups to take a foothold in some states and pass new 
voter suppression laws, gerrymander legislative districts, and even uh, pass laws that uh, increase our risk of electoral subversion or sort of stolen elections as well. So in other words, there's a trade-off, right? When a would-be autocrat is in DC, don't give them all the power, but over long stretches of time, having decentralized democratic institutions allows anti-democracy coalitions to establish a beach hold and that, you know, states regulate elections from local dog catcher up to presidency, right? So that sort of democratic backsliding is not just confined to that single state, right? They're affecting representation at all levels of government from local city councils all the way up to presidential elections. And finally, uh, there are a number of reasons, especially in today's politics, that lower levels of government and politics are actually more advantageous for wealthy groups than ordinary voters, as opposed to the national government. So today, what we've seen is, as technology and the internet uh, uh, have developed, now you can send money to any district, any election throughout the country. You can even start you know, an interest group in another state if you have sufficient money, and you can move that money extremely quickly around the country to fund whatever sort of political movement, policies, or politicians you want. Ordinary voters don't have that luxury, right? You can't say, oh, you know, I, oh, I really, uh, I see a candidate I like in another state. I'm gonna quickly change residencies, like get out the vote there. That doesn't work as well. This is an area where very wealthy individuals have an advantage at lower levels of government. In addition, over the past generation or so, we've seen the decline of state and local journalism, right? Huge decline in the revenues for state and local newspapers who cover state and local politics and the rise of cable news, highly nationalized national media conglomerates that own local papers and TV news stations, right? This has all reduced our knowledge of state and local politics and increased the influence of those who know about the fine print of state and local policy, which tends to be wealthy individuals and large corporations, right? These are areas where actually the state and local level, ironically, is getting less democratic, small d democratic, and then national level, we actually know much more about. I'm a PhD in political science, professor of political science, I know I have a really hard time voting in state legislative primary elections, right? I have to rely on national groups to tell me endorsements. With a presidential election, right, when it comes to the presidency, I know exactly who to vote for in presidential primaries, and I'm sure you do too, right? This is, all, this is in part because of the information environments at different levels of government and politics in the US. But, so now we'll turn to actually tracking what's going on with respect to democratic institutions in the states, right? Are states becoming healthier democracies? Are they uh, uh, undergoing democratic backsliding and why? And this part is gonna have, because I'm a quant, this is gonna have just a little bit of math, so bear with me, I think it'll be fun. Learning math is fun for everybody. Um, uh, so here we have no, so uh, there's a huge amount of interest in measuring democracy across countries, right? As, you know, Brazil on the cusp, is Brazil gonna undergo more democratic backsliding if Bolsonaro wins re-election? Uh, Hungary under Orban experiencing democratic backsliding. The Philippines, right? Uh, countries around the world under democratic strain. And quantitatively measuring that is a very popular thing. You've probably seen in news articles, measures like the polity group, or varieties of democracy or bright line watch, right? That sort of score how healthy democracies are around the world. But in the US, you can't really do that because there's 50 different authorities that regulate democracy. So you have to measure this at the state level, okay? And that's what I uh, do in that sort of, uh, I'd say the most, the part that's generated the most buzz of my work in uh, recent years. So what I do is I steal a lot of the strategies of the people who statistically measure the quality of democracy across countries and I apply that to the states. And to do that, I collect many, many indicators or specific variables of democracy in the states. So for example, what are a state's voter registration policies? Does it allow you to, if you're automatically registered to vote, does it give you same day voter registration? Does it have an extremely long 
waiting time period that you have to register to vote prior to the election, right? Uh, uh, measures of how gerrymandered state districts are, right? Does every vote have an equal influence on determining the majority of the state legislature or not? In addition to things like how long does it take on average to wait to vote in person by state? We know this, quants like me know this because of a disturbing access to smartphone data where we actually have people's geolocations and we can time how long it takes the average person waiting in line to vote. And recently they uh, made that data more secure and I think good for the world to make that data less accessible, but for a brief moment in the 20, late 2010s, like, oh man, we had geolocation data that was pretty wild. But anyways, the good thing about that scary moment of non-privacy with data is that I, we could estimate the average wait time to vote in states, and I think that was useful. Um, a lot of downsides to it. Um, so what I do is then I throw those democracy variables or indicators into a statistical model to generate sort of democracy scores for each state across time. And I'm showing you this complicated equation here so you go like, wow, that looks like some sophisticated math. But the point here, the point here is that I, the researcher, am not imposing my values about, ooh, I think you know, gerrymandering should, be, should make this kind of democracy score and voter ID law should do this to democracy scores. I'm letting the statistical model tell me how to weight the different indicators for coming up with a democracy score, okay? This sort of ties my hands in order to protect against the idea that it's just me with my personal opinions about my personal definition of democracy and I'm setting this up to, you know, like talk trash on some political group or something like that. No, I'm trying to bind my hands and say, this is what the statistical model says, the score that best predicts a state's real world democracy indicators, like it's wait times for voting and so forth. And here's a list of the indicators. I do this in really small font, so you go like, wow, this guy collected a lot of data from the states and that took a lot of work. Um, so here's that slide. And in bold are the indicators I'm gonna use for this particular electoral democracy measure that measures sort of how free, fair, accessible um, are elections in uh, the US states that regulate those elections. So the statistical model tells me, and I should finish up soon, uh, my statistical model tells me how each of these indicators affect a state's democracy score. So some, some uh, things like having no fault absentee voting increase a state's democracy score if it has a positive parameter value here, so other things, having early voting or having a mandatory post-election audit to ensure a vote counts, right? Those increase a state's democracy score are indicators of better democratic performance. Whereas other things like felon disenfranchisement, banning ex-felons from voting, or higher wait times to vote, or measures of gerrymandering, like this measure, the efficiency gap, which is essentially how much partisan bias are in district maps, those decrease a state's democracy score, okay? So now let's look at what's going on in the states over the past 20 years or so. And what I find is that the average state, these are, each of these gray lines is an individual state and then black is the average state. The average state isn't changing that much with respect to its democratic performance. But as you know, and as I just discussed, with a system of federalism, the average doesn't matter very much. It wouldn't matter back in the 1850s to say the average state doesn't have slavery or that in the Jim Crow period, the average state doesn't disenfranchise black Americans or prior to 1919 and the 19th Amendment uh, uh, giving national, uh, the national franchise for women and states had state by state women's voting rights, right? It would not be very effective to say, well, you know, the average state does grant women the right to vote. That wouldn't make a lot of sense. Similarly here, we can't just look at the average, we have to look what's going on under the hood. And here, the state democracy scores, I think, tell us some really important trends. Some states, like in this dotted line, are Washington state, and it starts as sort of a leader in democratic performance and becomes an even stronger leader as it uh, makes voting more accessible. As you all know, over the 2010s, Washington state uh, created new uh, automatic and same-day voter registration policies, has universal mail ballots that you can also drop off in person, 
along with states like Colorado, it's kind of a leader. Go Husky. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's cool to be in a state like that. Um, you got another set of states like Texas that are sort of below average. There's some fluctuations. They remain below average, but not huge changes over this time period. And another set of states, here's North Carolina, that really fall off a cliff in terms of Democratic backsliding by setting records of partisan bias in gerrymandering districts, restricting uh, the vote, and more recently passing policies that uh, further enable the prospect of electoral subversion. So why is democracy expanding and contracting in the states? Um, there's uh, you know, some important potential explanations, right? Maybe it's partisan competition. Maybe it's polarization between Democrats and Republicans within a state. They hate each other, so they're both burning down democracy. Maybe it's racial threat, new immigrant groups, or black in-migration within the US causes uh, you know, the sort of existing population to say, you know, we want to uh, make democracy more narrow and not expand democratic institutions to these newcomers. Uh, or maybe it's something about the political parties themselves. So here I'll just say uh, uh, before I end, because I need to, is it's not about racial threat within states. These are the top five backsliding states over the past 20 years. Wisconsin, Ohio, Tennessee, North Carolina, Alabama. Those are not rapidly diversifying states, right? Over this time period, their black and Latino populations have been pretty stable, right? But that doesn't mean race isn't central to threats to democracy in the US. Rather, it means that racial conflict in the US is highly national right now. As a quantitative political scientist, my joke now is that's unfortunately actually true, is that if you want to know how somebody votes in national elections, which party they vote for, you would rather, as a statistical predictor, you would not like to have their, their beliefs about the minimum wage or health insurance. That's not gonna be very predictive. What is, is attitudes about Lizzo playing that flute at the Library of Congress, or like attitudes towards Colin Kaepernick, right? It's national racial iconography and cultural resentment rather than internal local racial politics like the politics of Jim Crow. The politics of Jim Crow were about you know, desegregating or remaining segregated local institutions, right? Whereas now this is much more about the direction of the country overall, okay? Close to zero effects of local racial demographic change, but that, again, does not mean race isn't central to the story. What I really find is that when a Republican party gains unified control of the governorship and state legislature in a state, that's what is backsliding democracy. This is not something I came in seeking to find, right? I would like something more interesting, potentially. But here, this is a finding that political scientists increasingly have to grapple with, partisan asymmetry on democratic institutions, where now the strong and extremely strong predictor of democratic backsliding within states is control by the Republican Party, and you can cut this up any way statistically um, you find that States controlled by the Democratic Party in blue or by divided governments in green are being diverged away from by Republican Party states in red here. There's no way you can measure democracy 100,000 ways like I do statistically here to say it's not just my opinion on how to measure democracy. No matter what you do, Republican control continues to show up as the largest driver of Democratic backsliding. And uh, that is about the nationalization of the two political parties um, with the Republican Party combining uh, uh, sort of a set of interests that uh, uh, sort of now have an interest in uh, restricting democracy. And there are major policy implications for democratic backsliding in the states, okay? So here, uh, along with uh, political scientist Chris Warshaw, we wrote two pieces in the Washington Post and Politico on recent post-Dobbs full abortion bans in the states, right? A state level policy after the Dobbs decision. And here what we did is plotted the percent of a state's public that agrees or supports the state's post Roe or post Dobbs decision abortion policy with red, the red states being the ones that are banning abortion. And what you see here is many states that are banning abortion have, do not have majority support for these abortion bans. So why are these state governments able to get away with an unpopular, highly salient policy like that when the majority opposes that policy? And the answer is restricting democracy and gerrymandering. The best predictor is 
a heavily gerrymandered state legislative map where a minority of voters who opposes abortion rights sets the majority of the state legislature and the pro-choice majority of voters has no way to hold their state, legislative account state legislatures accountable because of those district maps, okay? This is highly consequential for real policies that affect people's lives. The rules of the game have downstream consequences on actual policies that affect sort of all sorts of socioeconomic outcomes and recent sort of abortion bans are a just highly visible uh, uh, consequence of sort of the decline of democracy in some states. Even more so, something not measured in my statistical measure here, is this new acute danger of electoral subversion, which is the idea that a state, a state government and delegated county election administrators will give electoral college votes to a presidential candidate that does not win the voters of their state. Or a candidate refuses to leave office after losing an election. Those are called electoral subversion and now we have a large number of candidates running for offices uh, at the local level, at really important state level offices, secretaries of state and governorships, as well as for Congress that explicitly endorse the sort of stop the steal conspiracy and state legislatures have passed new policies to further enable the prospect of uh, electoral subversion. A state legislator saying, I don't care what the voters of my state say, I'm gonna give our electoral college votes for my state to the presidential candidate that we want. And uh, right now it's sort of up in the air what the Supreme Court will do about it. I'm no big city lawyer, but uh, the, what's called the independent state legislature's doctrine or theory, it's uh, legal scholars are sort of debating right now how viable it's gonna be in the Supreme Court, but there's a chance the Supreme Court says it's okay for state governments to do that sort of electoral subversion. By contrast to elect, uh, electoral democracy, I wanna say measuring democracy in other ways, like if you focus on sort of authoritarianism and civil liberties, that comes out as much more bipartisan. There's not this partisan effect where Republicans and Democrats are doing something differently. By contrast, when it comes to something like mass incarceration, right, we know that the US has more people in jail and prison per capita and in absolute terms than all other countries across the world, including larger countries than the US, authoritarian regimes and so forth. The US has more prisoners, right? That doesn't seem, that in, under some definitions of democracy, that doesn't seem great. And if you measure democracy with that sort of uh, uh, definition, then you see that actually blue and red states, which control criminal justice in the US, have both pursued uh, the sort of policies that drove mass incarceration since the 1970s and 1990s, okay? So here you see, uh, uh, for example, so we know states run policing and prisons. There's a lot of TV about the feds, right? Or like the DEA and the, you know, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and like we watch like Breaking Bad and the feds and stuff. But actually 95% of prisoners are state and local, right? This is a state level authority. Mass incarceration was a red and blue phenomenon. And recent increases in crime that have become extremely salient in these 2022 midterm elections, especially if you turn on cable news, um, and especially if you turn on conservative cable news, it's wall to wall uh, crime coverage, including of like, certain model cities like Seattle. Like, you know, I was on a plane recently and they, you know, person asked me where I lived, I said Seattle, and they were like, how, how do you do it? Like, that bur city burned to a crisp. And I said, yeah, I was like, oh man, missed it. Um, but uh, the point here is that you see pr crime increases since 2019 with whether a, a local prosecutor is a progressive prosecutor or not, there's no real relationship, right? And this is, you can study this in really every way. There's no local characteristic that predicts crime increases. We're in a national, I'd consider moderate crime increase period. Nothing like the 1990s when I was growing up, but it has been a modest increase, but it's been national rather than tied to local factors. Um, finally, overall, my book is really about the collision of national polarized parties, right? Two national teams, the Democratic and Republican parties, colliding with the decentralized institutions of American federalism that give so much authority to the state and local level, especially the state level, okay? I believe this has been a fundamental transformation of American politics with hugely consequential outcomes and that are 
political party system and the politics we all engage in are increasingly incompatible with the institutions of American democracy, which put all that authority at this lower level of government, and it's having major ramifications. So check out my book, uh, Laboratories Against Democracy, uh, in, the next, um, in the next version of this talk in a couple months. Uh, please come back. This was the depressing version of the talk. <laughs> the next one is gonna be on what actual, my, my and others' quantitative statistical research suggests are ways to sort of get out of threats of democracy and reverse trends, and there are some ways. It's not the ways, again, the horse race coverage will have you thinking, ooh, if certain politicians will change their messaging in the right way, then, you know, democracy is safe. Actually, there are, that's not an especially effective solution, but there really are some. So uh, come back in a couple months. Uh, thanks again so much for your time. Really appreciate it. <laughs> and I'll, I can field a Q and A, so uh, feel free to come up to the, uh, I'll uh, look at some questions here and then, uh, um, I got a good one over email, but uh, if uh, folks want to line up at the microphones, I'll field those too. Go ahead. So it seems like, you can hear me, it seems like um, a big part of your conclusion was that like a long-term unified Republican control is the greatest predictor of a de decline in in-state dem democratic institutions. Is there a similar effect on democratic institutions within a state for a prolonged unified democratic control? Great question. Question here is, okay, so I find this effect of Republican control of state government uh, leads to democratic backsliding. Do I find an opposite unified democratic control increases democracy scores? I actually don't. So here you see this green line here is states where one chamber of the legislature or the governorship is held by Republicans and the others Democrats, right? You know, what we'll likely have in Congress right now, split Democratic president, maybe one chamber of Congress will be Republican, right? Those states don't seem to be doing backsliding very much. Um, and Democratic states sometimes, in some key states that have, in times of expansion, been controlled by Democrats, Washington State, Colorado as well over this time period, but systematically, no, it's really driven by Republican backsliding, and any state can do sort of modest increases. Um, that's a really excellent question. One of the things that I sort of realize outside of this is that uh, institutions of higher learning, especially state universities in red states that are primarily liberal in orientation, like the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, or um, the People's Republic of Austin, which seem to have dropped into Texas by accident type of thing. One of the things I was wondering is that most of the states that consider themselves conservative, their voting patterns are such that the lower level of education, the more likely they are to be conservative. Do you find that when people in conservative-leaning states go to their states higher education institutions, primarily the, the best known as the best ones, they sort of beat feet out of that state once they get their bachelor's, master's, or doctorates to move to a state where their politics are more likely to match the state level. Excellent question. First part was sort of the Decline in support for higher education in some states, is that uh, contributing to democratic backsliding? And the second part was maybe one explanation for that is higher educated people leaving uh, places that go on to experience democratic backsliding. And so a couple things there, taking the last part first, it is true that now education is a much greater predictor of vote choice than it ever has been, and that's a, actually a big change. 
Now we don't see much of an income effect on your vote choice, right? Both parties are cross-class coalitions now. The Republican Party really does have some working class voters and the Democratic Party also has some working class voters. Um, both parties also have uh, you know, somewhat wealthy voters and uh, highly educated voters, but college education now is essentially the best demographic predictor outside of race now, which is quite unique for it to beat income as a predictor. And I would say when we went back to the uh, structural economic change, it's partially state level policies, but it's also partially um, uh, uh, issues of where economic activity uh, just coalesces. So in a knowledge economy, right, where uh, financial services and technology are a much bigger proportion of the economy and economic growth now than manufacturing, which used to be the mid 20th century driver and create sort of equal middle class wages across educational groups in that era. So it's partially the structural economic change does mean no matter where you live in the country, if you're a young college educated person, you're gonna try to move to one of these agglomeration economy cities, right? That often has like financial services and tech. So that does increase the influx of educated people to these more liberal cities. That is absolutely the case. I would say overall too, as a flashpoint, there's long been sort of higher education as uh, a sort of sociocultural conflict as well in American politics. Um, uh, all that is to say at the same time, we have seen blue states and divided states really cut uh, expenditures for higher public higher education as well. So um, I wouldn't say it's all, you know, polarized in roses on one side, but uh, um, it's absolutely the case that education is increasingly polarizing. Um, and uh, it's also the case that uh, a policy that's been known to increase economic growth uh, in areas is to support higher education uh, in those areas so the workforce has higher, you know, as economists call it, human capital. So the lack of investment in higher education has sort of hastened the exodus of uh, educated, uh, college educated individuals who tend to also be more liberal in their political attitudes. I would say, in addition though, we don't find statistically much effect of actually going to college. It's not that people like transform in college and it's certainly not the professors, but there is something about the social aspect of it that seems to have a liberalizing effect, but it's unfortunately, you know, can't get my students to read the syllabus, so no wonder they're not like, they're not, uh, you know, being indoctrinated very effectively, but uh, um, it's the case that it's more the social aspect of college rather than instruction having political effects. Um, let's do a couple more in person. Go for it. Hey, um, could you go to the last, well, second to last slide about the prosecutors? And just, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and just expand a bit about how you define progressive prosecutor and just, uh, just what you think about those findings in general, because that really is interesting. Yeah, so this was a graph by this uh, criminologist, John Pfaff, P-F-A-F-F, -F, and he does uh, two different measures. This is the broader measure of pro like a progressive prosecutor, and then there's a narrower measure that only gets like, you know, Larry Krasner in Philly, Chesa Boudin in like the highly progressive ones, and there's still uh, similarly no relationship. But uh, uh, go check out John Pfaff's work on this. But similarly, so, um, in addition, there's a new, there's a working paper, economics paper that's nice by Jennifer Doliak and co-authors that does uh, uh, um, sort of bail reform and a bunch of the sort of like progressive criminal justice reforms effects on uh, crime over the past few years and finds no effect of, of those on subsequent crime increases. So we're, we do seem to be living in a, with a sort of more national crime increase that unfortunately like our public politics obscures um, so we don't talk, we talk a lot, and you'll hear a lot about, you know, San Francisco, Seattle, Portland, Chicago, Philly. We don't hear about, you know, one of the record setters of increased murders was Jacksonville, Florida. Um, we don't hear much about uh, places that are culturally very different. Um, but that's, you know, people got to get clicks and views and sell, you know, sell, a, sell, I guess to the extent there are newspapers, sell newspapers. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, I wish it was a more interesting story, but it seems to be a sort of just national increase. But that doesn't mean that parties don't capitalize differently on sort of uh, backlash to crime, and particularly backlash to the 2020 uh, Black Lives Matter movement as well. 
Could you go back to about your third slide, sure which thing. was the Democratic and Republican counties and the, oh, uh, yeah, the gap of mor on mortality? Absolutely. And I would argue that this isn't really very honest, that it's not really Republican counties and Democratic counties, it's urban counties and rural counties. Rural counties tend to be Republican, urban counties tend to be Democratic. Right. Um, the one problem with even that analysis is say Jackson, Mississippi. Right. This is a very Democratic county in a very Republican state which has denied health care and education to the occupants of the Democratic county. Yet even there in that urban county, they have more access to health care than does someone in the Mississippi Delta. Well said, so a uh, point here. One is the overall backdrop. There's not just polarization between states that I've been talking about today, right? You know, blue and purple states uh, moving away from red states, but also within states, this was an extremely important point. Within states, there's record set setting polarization between the urban and more exurban and rural areas within states. This is true in Washington state, as we know. Um, this is true of, and less so in Washington, although it's intense, the sort of, polarization within Washington state, but uh, especially in uh, states like Wisconsin with uh, Milwaukee and Madison and then uh, the sort of exurbs and rural areas of Wisconsin, highly polarized. And then it's true that there are many blue cities within red states and huge red areas within uh, uh, blue states. So uh, one of the cliches is there's more Democratic voters in Texas than there are in Washington state, right? It's a larger state. Um, this is, there are, you know, really millions and millions of people, like, it, the reality is much more purple when it comes to individuals, right? But when it comes to the public policies, you can actually map them pretty perfectly based on which party controls the state. But within a state, right, you have to know much more about the actual geography of the individual and other things like their demographics and, you know, college education, these sorts of things. Um, but then here also, we have to think about the transformations that have hit rural and exurban areas differently than urban areas when it comes to things like health outcomes. So the opioid crisis, for example, is one. Um, another is the decline of manufacturing, right? Where like mining is automated in West Virginia and really destroys middle class wages in West Virginia and really uh, causes increasingly uh, people with access to college educated middle class work to leave for uh, better economic prospects, right? Um, uh, you have, uh, in addition, the policy choices like refusing Medicaid expansion, right? Um, all of these contribute to this dynamic, but uh, one interesting thing is like, you know, so which party is like causing this is different, but the relationship is very clear here. Um, but it's a product of both policy and these structural economic changes and things that, uh, you know, uh, that are structural that occur like a crisis like the opioid crisis and how, how it hits different places differently. All right, let's do two more questions. Okay, I'd like to ask about national voting rights legislation. You mentioned yeah. uh, the Voting Rights Act 1965. That's right. was a landmark uh, decision. Uh, obviously, the Supreme Court has eviscerated parts of that, which is a whole completely separate issue. Um, but can you comment on the John Lewis Voting Rights Act or yeah. some version of that? What is it exactly? And does it have any prospects of being implemented during the lame duck really session? Good, really and, good. And, and then how does that tie into your thesis on uh, subversion of voting at, yeah. at the local and state levels? Yeah, I'll just preview. This is really helpful to, to sort of end on. I'll preview for to come back next talk. So one solution, right, as has been true throughout American history is to pass national congressional legislation to establish baseline rules across states to say states at a minimum, you have to do, you can like expand voting through different new registration policies, whatever you want. You can't get below some, you can't disenfranchise below some level. The Voting Rights Act was that law, but it didn't establish its own real agency. It had a, uh, the Voting Rights Act has prosecutors with the Department of Justice who, depending on the presidential regime, will be more or less aggressive in policing voting rights changes. But the one part that was sort of automatic of the Voting Rights Act was Section 5. And in the Shelby County 2013 Supreme Court decision, they end this Section 5, which says automatically states have to check with the Department of Justice before restricting voting in any way. 
whereas now they don't have to do that automatic check. Um, so that was a really crucial, I'd, I'd say, tied for the most important part of the Voting Rights Act. And as a response to that, you saw this innovation of new state level policy saying, now this is legal to restrict voting rights uh, a bit more. So the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Act was an update to sort of uh, restate those parts of the Voting Rights Act. But there were additional broader bills and they all, you know, in legislative politics, they, things keep getting repackaged and things, but uh, in general, um, so the John Lewis Voting Rights Act was a focus on those voter suppression policies that we talked about, but I think actually partisan gerrymandering has probably been more consequential for the decline in democracy, and the con Congress can easily nationally ban gerrymandering to say states must draw maps that give balanced influence to all geographies and parties of voters, that's mathematically very easy to do, right? Um, they could do that if they wanted, right? Um, all of these policies didn't get through the Senate filibuster. Um, I don't, well, I'll leave, uh, um, during the lame duck session in our second talk, we'll talk about the prospects of this. Um, but there are other things, and then finally, uh, no real policy on the congressional agenda really tackled that electoral subversion part but has increasingly uh, become part of the conversation and we're seeing early bills be drafted to reform what's called the Electoral Count Act and say states can't just give electoral college votes in a presidential election to whoever they want. All right, I think we should end there. Um, thank you guys so much for uh, coming and uh, hope to see you in uh, a few months. <laughs>